Hello everyone, it is Seth, probably better known as Saffron Olive. We are back here today with another edition of Budget Magic. This week we have a sweet one. A few weeks ago, a fan of the series commented that he had gotten out of Magic, he used to play a long time ago, got out of the game and was recently getting back into it, as Magic tends to do to people, it draws you back in sooner or later. And he had always loved mill decks, and he wanted to know if there were any competitive mill decks that he could play that were also budget-friendly. And mill is definitely not my thing. I hadn't thought about it, didn't really have any great idea. So this week, I finally got around to looking into the possibility of a competitive mill deck, and I was pleasantly surprised. Uh, there wasn't enough pieces to make a standard deck, but so we ended up in modern, and this deck was surprisingly competitive. Uh, we won about 50% of our matches, which is great for a mill deck, or <laughs> great for a budget deck, also great for a mill deck, I guess, but it was great for a uh, great for a budget deck, and even in the games we lost, it felt like we were close. We were one land drop short, we were one card short of actually winning the game, so even when we didn't win, it, we had competitive matches, so I was pretty impressed with the deck overall. Anyway, comes in at just over 20 bucks online, just over 94 on paper. So, pretty cost effective, especially online. Super cheap. Anyway, the deck itself breaks down into three pieces. We have mill cards, we have payoff cards, and then we have just a couple utility cards. Uh, so let's talk about the mill cards first. We have four copies of Hedron Crab. One blue mana, you get a 0-2 with landfall, that whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control, you can mill three. So this is just a repetitive source of mill. It also is awesome with fetch lands. As you can see, since we're budget, we don't get to play Polluted Delta, don't get to play Flooded Strand. So we have four copies of Evolving Wilds, uh, a fetch land, and four copies of Terramorphic Expanse, uh, which is a functional reprint of Evolving Wilds. Or actually, Evolving Wilds is the reprint of Terramorphic, but who's counting? Anyway, with those, we can play a Crab on turn one, follow that up by an Evolving Wilds or a Terramorphic Expanse on turn two, and mill six cards on the spot. And Crab is awesome because it just sits out there. People sometimes ignore it because it doesn't look all that threatening. But over the course of time, that incremental damage, uh, <laughs> or mill damage, I guess, adds up. Uh, so I've been very happy with it. One, definitely one of the key mill cards in the deck. Uh, up next we have Dream Twist. Dream Twist is one blue mana. Target player mills three cards. And you can flash it back for one and a blue. This is definitely one of the worst mill cards in our deck, but it's kind of a necessary evil. Uh, in the budget version, there are a couple expensive mill spells that we can't really play, most notably Glimpsey Unthinkable. So we need to fill that slot with something, and Dream Twist is the best option uh, out of what we have. Speaking of Glimpsey Unthinkable, we also get to play Breaking Entering. Now, we don't get to cast the Entering half since we don't have any red mana, but Breaking is more or less a budget alternative to Glimpsey Unthinkable. It mills two less cards, but for one blue and one black mana, you can have target player put the top eight cards of his or her library into his or her graveyard. Uh, and Glimpse the Unthinkable is super expensive, way too expensive for a budget deck. It would have eaten up our entire budget by itself and then some. But Breaking is actually surprisingly cheap at under $3 a playset. Um, so I've been very happy with that card. Definitely another one of the key mill cards in our deck. Up next we have Mind Funeral. Mind Funeral is a funny one. Uh, it's it's very powerful when it works well, but it is also very random. So for one, a blue and a black, target player reveals cards from the top of his or her library until four land cards are revealed. That player puts all the cards revealed that way into his or her graveyard. So it's a mill card. It really depends on how lucky you are. If you consider that the average modern deck is probably about one-third land, uh, maybe a little more than that, you should hit somewhere around 11, 12 cards uh, with Mind Funeral for three mana, which certainly isn't bad. The trouble is you can't really count on it, because there's definitely times when you hit six cards, <laughs> because there's a big stack of lands on top, or there's other times when you'll hit 18 cards, because there's no lands to be seen. So it's very, it's just hard to count on. If your opponent has 13 cards left in their library, it's risky to trust that Mind Funeral is going to get the job done. Uh, then the premier card in our deck, Archive Trap. Archive Trap is awesome. It is by far the best mill card in Modern. Uh, basically, 
It is 3 and 2 blue, and it mills 13 cards. So the rate is solid, but the real key is if an opponent is a trap cost. So if an opponent searches their library, and fetch lands, of course, search libraries, you can pay zero for Archive Trap. Why it hasn't happened, in theory, Archive Trap, if you have four of them in your hand, mills enough cards that you can win the game on turn two if your opponent cracks a fetch land. Uh, but this is just really where you want to be. It creates this weird sub-game. If you play Legacy, you'll see people try to play around Stifle by cracking their fetches at certain times. Archive Trap, once your opponent knows about it, kind of does the same thing for Modern. really makes them think about when they crack their fetches, because they always have this fear that you're just going to mill 13 or 26 cards out of nowhere and destroy them. In fact, Archive Trap is so good, we get to play a copy of Trap Maker Snare, which is one in a blue for an instant, which tutors for a trap card. So in our main deck, Trap Maker Snare is basically just the fifth copy of Archive Trap. That's how much we want Archive Traps, as we're willing to play Trap Maker Snare as a fifth copy. Um, then we have Thought Scour. That's our final mill card. You might not really think of Thought Scour as a mill card, because we're used to milling ourselves with it. It's a way to cycle, fuel the graveyard for Delve or Snapcaster. But it is a mill card, you can, uh, and it replaces itself, so it's pretty powerful. Only milling two cards isn't great, but the fact that it doesn't cost you a card makes it worthwhile. You get this like slight benefit of milling two cards while you still get to draw a card, so it doesn't really cost you anything. The payoffs in this deck are sweet. One of the examples I like to use for mill decks, and if you read through the article on this deck, you'll see it comes up in there a lot, is that a mill deck is a lot like a burn deck. Uh, except all of your burn spells are overcosted. Like, they just don't compare. There isn't a lightning bolt. Uh, since milling one card is only one third as powerful as damage, since you start with 60 cards in your library versus 20 life, there is no lightning bolt. A lightning bolt of a mill spell would be one mana mill nine cards. There's nothing that comes close to that. So, the reason to play a deck like Mill over a deck like Burn, which is really similar in strategies, actually, when you think about it, is that we get these payoff cards in Mill that, <laughs> that Burn decks just don't get. Payoff card number one, Jace's Phantasm. It's a one-mana dragon, basically, in our deck. It's a one-mana one, one flying, so a flying men. But if an opponent's graveyard has ten or more cards in it, it gets plus four, plus four. So it's a five-five flyer for one mana. And in our deck, we can pretty consistently do this on turn two. Uh, definitely by turn three. So it's just a huge undercost beater. Uh, and it shuts down basically everything. Blocks and trades with Tarmogoyf most of the time. All that for one mana. And we're not doing anything our deck doesn't want to do to fill, uh, fuel it up. So we're not playing crappy cards. We're playing all these mill cards that we want to be playing anyway. And Phantasm just happens to benefit from it. So that's payoff number one. Payoff number two, my favorite of the payoffs, Visions of Beyond. <laughs> uh, in our deck, this is just Ancestral Recall in the late game. Instant, draw a card. If a graveyard has 20 or more cards in it, draw three cards instead. So basically, you can always cycle it, so it's never really bad. And then, after you cast a few mill spells, Visions just draws three. They're easy to chain together. Uh, it's just, it's such a great way of refilling your hand. And I think it's, in most of the games that we win, and uh, Visions from Beyond is a key part of it. Like, drawing three for one mana is extremely powerful. Finally, probably the funniest of our payoff cards, Crypt Incursion. So, for two and a black, you get an instant that exiles all creatures from target player's graveyard, and you gain three life for each card exiled this way. I think my record with Crypt Incursion, and it's in one of the videos, is gaining 54 life, and I can tell you 54 life is a lot. Like, a lot of decks can't come back from that. The main idea is it gives us fringe benefits against some things like Blood Gas or Grave Crawler, where you can just randomly hose or dredge if someone's playing dredge. It just randomly hoses them main deck. But the main idea is it buys us 3 or 4 or 5 or 10 extra turns from all the life game, which gives us a ton of extra time to draw into uh, more mill spells and win the game. Uh, finally, the kind of <laughs> utility cards. Four copies of Doomblade, just a removal smell, destroy target non-black creature. I think this was a mistake. I think these should be dismembers. As you can see, we have dismembers in the sideboard. These should just be flip-flopped, should have the dismembers main, 
in Doomblade or some other removal spell on the sideboard. But it's still fine. It's just a way to kill something we need to kill. Uh, in the lands, we have four I or seven islands. Uh, the four Evolving Wilds, two Terramorphic Expanses we already talked about. Four copies of Swamp and three Sheldock Isle. Sheldock Isle is a sweet one. It's a hideaway land, so when it comes into play, you look at the top four cards of your library, and you get to exile one of them. And then when a certain condition is met, you can pay one blue mana and cast the card you exiled. For Sheldock Isle, the condition is a library having 20 or fewer cards in it. Uh, it does enter the battlefield tapped, but it also adds blue mana, so it's just a really low opportunity cost, uh, powerful card. Obviously, since it needs 20 or less cards in a library, we're not uh, activating this till far in the late game. But there's definitely been cases where I put a Crypt Incursion, for example, under Sheldock Isle, and I'm just crossing my fingers and hoping we can get our opponent under 20 cards, knowing that that Crypt Incursion should win us the game. And it's also just fine to put a mill spell under it. Also worth noting, you can, you, uh, there's no timing restriction here. So even if you put a creature or a sorcery or a planeswalker under the Sheldock Isle, you can cast it as an instant uh, anytime you can pay that one blue mana and tap the Sheldock Isle. So the sideboard, it's important to talk about these cards because they play very specific and important roles. I already mentioned Dismember. Those should be going in the main in place of Doomblade and moving Doomblade to the sideboard. But the other three are just super essential. Surgical Extraction, uh, so one Phyrexian black mana, so you can either pay black or two life. You get to choose a card in a graveyard other than a basic land. Search its owner's graveyard hand and library for any number of cards with the same name. Exile those cards and the player shuffles their library. So this is a targeted way to deal with very specific problems. Your opponent has a blood gas. Blood gas is really bad for us because we are milling our opponent's stack and giving them all these free creatures. Same with Gravecrawler, Life on the Loam, uh, even Grizzlebrand in like the reanimate strategies. Like this is a way if our opponent discards a Grizzlebrand and goes to reanimate it with Gorios Vengeance, we can just uh, send off our Surgical Extraction and not only get rid of the one Grizzlebrand, but all the Grizzlebrands. So since we are filling our opponent's graveyard, this is a way to combat that advantage in decks that are looking to abuse their graveyard. Ravenous Trap is kind of the same thing, but here there's one really specific <laughs> instance where Ravenous Trap is important. And, and it's fine against Dredge and other things like that, even against Snapcaster decks, but the main thing is our deck has a really hard time beating Eldrazi's, like Emrakul, for example, because we mill them and then they shuffle the entire library back into uh, the graveyard, and it undoes all of our work. Ravenous Trap costs zero mana if three or more cards were put into a um, a player's graveyard from anywhere this turn. So if we mill a bunch of cards with, uh, I don't know, our Archive Trap, and one of those cards happens to be an Emrakul, uh, without Ravenous Trap, we're pretty much done for. That not only counters our Archive Trap, but all of our mill spells before that. Ravenous Trap, cast it for free, instant speed, and it exiles everything. So we get rid of the Emrakul, uh, and, and that's the difference between that and Surgical Extraction or Crypt Incursion. Crypt Incursion or Surgical Extraction get rid of the Emrakul, but the trigger's still on the stack and the rest of the cards still shuffle into the library, and it still undoes all of our work. Ravenous Trap just gets rid of everything, including the Emrakul, so it's like essential for beating decks that are playing Eldrazi or other shuffle into the library effects. And finally, Set Adrift. I'm proud of this one. This is one of my, uh, <laughs> my favorite finds for this deck. The other problem for this deck, much like a burn deck, is Leyline of Sanctity. Blue and Black, as you might guess, is not very good at answering a resolved enchantment. And Leyline of Sanctity <laughs> comes down really quickly, uh, since you can play it before the game even starts if it's in your opening hand. So you can't even really count on countering it. So we needed a way to deal with Leyline of Sanctity, which just gives a player hexproof, which means none of our mill spells can target that player. And we basically can't win the game. I, I guess our plan B would be to mill ourselves and try to win with Jace's Phantasm, which just isn't all that realistic. So I started thinking like Echoing Truth, uh, some sort of Bounce Spell, Void Snare. The problem is we aren't a big turn combo deck. Unlike Storm or a deck like that, where you can bounce a Ley Line and win in one turn, we can't really do that. We need to get rid of the Ley Line permanently. So the answer I came up with is Set Adrift. Set Adrift is a 5 and a blue, so it seems expensive, but it has a delve. 
and we fill our graveyard pretty fast with all these uh, random cheap spells we're playing. And it just says, put target non-land permanent on top of its owner li owner's library. So, yes, putting it on top of our owner's library, its owner's library, doesn't really get rid of it permanently. But, remember, we're a mill deck. So the idea is we can set adrift a ley line of sanctity. Uh, and then we can mill it using uh, Hedron Crab or Archive Crab, whatever, Dream Twist. And that's a way for us to permanently get out from under the ley line of sanctity lock which just beats us. Like, if someone plays a ley line without set adrift, we just cannot win. Uh, anyway, I, like I said before, I was really impressed with the deck this week. I think it played really well. It was more competitive than I imagined. I think I have this typical spiky outlook on Mill, that it's kind of a noob deck and a casual deck, but it's not a competitive deck. Well, I don't really think that's true. Like, this deck can keep up with some of the most powerful decks in the format, and it has answers to a lot of things, so definitely give it a try. Uh, I think you'll have fun with it, and I hope you enjoy the videos.